Good evening, everyone. So staying dry with make files. Sorry for the cutesy title. If anyone is not familiar with DRY, that means don't repeat yourself. So if you, you now know what dry is. So if you want to stay dry, you don't want to be wet. You don't want to be waiting for your unnecessary reprocessing. You don't want to be editing um, manually, temporarily editing scripts. And you don't want to be wasting time. Um, so how do make files do that? Well, first, make files, like, what are they? They're for compiling C, C++, right? Has, first of all, has anyone used a make file here? Ooh, a lot of hands, a lot more than I thought. Used for compiling programs, probably. Anybody use them for anything else? Joshua? OK. Um, so what I'm going to propose to you is that make files are going to save you a lot of time. Um, using them as something uh, that you'd normally use a shell script to do. So um, they give you easy parallel processing and keep track of dependencies so that you don't have to. Uh, so there's actually two things here. There's, there's make the executable. That's the actual script that does the interpretation of a make file um, that you are writing to describe your process. Uh, <clears throat> so make files are just text files with a particular syntax. They're not that different from, say, Python or um, a YAML file. They're, the main parts are a target. Well, that's the file you're trying to build. Um, a prerequisite or multiple prerequisites. That's what, what that file depends on. Um, and then a recipe. Could be multiple commands um, that are going to Use your prerequis prerequisites to build that target. Um, and you'll see the comments are hashtag de you know, denoted comments. So my uh, pseudocode example is like making pizza. So to make your pizza, you have dough, sauce, and cheese. Those are your ingredients. And then you execute a number of steps. You shape the dough. You spread the sauce. You sprinkle cheese on top. And then you bake in order to make the pizza. Um, so down below here we have what I would call like a, an idiomatic, very compact make file. Oftentimes in make files, people use a lot of the same target names so that when you go from a make file in one project you, and to another project, you don't have to understand what those targets mean. They mean the same thing across projects, but it's completely a convention. Um, so the two main ones that you'll probably see in almost any make file are the default target and the clean target. So the default rule or default target um, is just what you normally want to run when you run that make. Um, so all of the files that you might want to build are going to be listed as dependencies of that default target. And you'll notice that I have here this line about .phony. Um, that just means that these are not actual files. So make is very much like oriented towards, is there a file on the file system? If there's not, how do I build it? Um, but when you mark something as a phony target, that means that don't actually look for a file here. Um, if you didn't say .phony and you had a file named default in your directory, the make would say, I, I don't need to do anything. Default's already here. Um, so that's, that's why you want to use .phony. And then clean, that is, by convention, how you clean up the entire project um, and remove the, the data files that you've produced in the middle of the project. So you, if you want to start from scratch um, in your project, you would say make clean. Make the clean target, remove all of those files, and start over. Question for you. Go back. Sure. So in the, the middle um, shaded area, you've got the, the pizza, dough, sauce, and cheese. Mm -hmm. And to me, those are objects. And then when you look below, you've got actions to do in the objects. So my question is, shape and spread are in green, sprinkle, sprinkle and bake are not. Does it not matter? Because I thought you were trying to tell us something with the color. Actually, I'm not sure why it chose to highlight shape and spread. I use the, the markdown, like, interpret, make. Uh, syntax. 
So I'm not sure why they're, they're highlighted that way. It's just meant to stand in for like what you would typically use on, on a Linux command line. Um, I'm going to get to exactly what happens in those lines in just a, just a minute. So how to make files work. Um, first, before it does anything, make parses the file, um, and it tries to execute either, um, or it, it chooses it as its target either the default rule if you haven't specified anything or if you said make and then some other target, it's going to try to build that object, that file. Um, so there's two phases. Uh, one is where it, it parses the file, internalizes all the variables and values that are, that are created in the make file, and then it creates a dependency graph, the potential plan. Here's a an example of what that might look like, and I'll show you the make file that produces this dependency graph um, in just a minute. And then in phase two, it determines which targets need to be updated. So um, it's all based on uh, what, I'll, what I call timestamps. It's the last modified time for these files. So if I switch back to my diagram here, you know, you see at the top the default target. That's that's what we're trying to build. That's the very last thing that's going to get built. And then anything that it depends on is going to be you know, following a line to, to that object. So I grouped these things together. They're, all of these individual small boxes represent files um, in the make file. And I'll, I'll switch over to that in just a second. But um, it's going to, make is going to look at each of these files and say, OK, well, I want to build default. So in order to build that, I need to go to this, these years files. There's one marked 2017, 2018, 2019. Are they out of date? And do they exist at all? So if they exist and they're newer than anything they depend on, it's going to build or it's going to, um, sorry, if, it's, if it exists and it's newer than anything it depends on, it's going to say, I don't need to build anything. Um, if it's older than a dependency or doesn't exist at all, it's, it's going to want to build those files. So, so then it executes the plan. So each line of those recipes, it's, it's a run of a separate subshell by default. Unless you use this dot one shell uh, um, flag, which I've never used. Um, so. I've, I've read there's other caveats and behavior changes when you do that. Um, it may give you some benefit of being able to, to keep environment information throughout the make file, but I've never seen anyone use it. Um, so, you know, caveat emptor. Um, <laughs> so uh, as make executes the plan, um, if it finds an error code from any one of the lines, so let's say we, we error out on spreading the sauce, it's going to stop there, and any jobs that are still running, let's say you're running things in parallel, it's going to wait until they finish and then stop the entire make. Like it's, it's not going to kill anything that's running successfully, but, um, but it will stop and, and not continue unless you use the dash command within that recipe or a dash i on the command line. There's so, there's so much in make that's uh, configurable. So it can be a little overwhelming when you look at um, the, the documentation and see, well, OK, this is how it normally behaves. But then you can also negate this behavior or do, do things differently. Um, so I want to show the example of the make file that produces this dependency graph. Just and here's what that looks like. So there's. In the first part of the make file, you'll see a couple of variables. These represent all the files that are going to be produced in the middle of this make. The order these appear in is not important. The, so you can have commands pretty much and, and variables in pretty much any order because make parses the whole file before it does anything. Um, I like to keep variables at the top or potentially grouped with the recipes that they belong with. Um, if you get a really big make file and you know, it just makes more logical sense to, to group things together. Um, 
And then here we have the default rule. That's the very first rule. So that's, it's named default and it will be picked by make as the default. Um, so I've referenced these different variables which contain file names. And that's what make is going to build by default when I run make. And then I have a clean recipe. And then I have some more recipes that I actually use to make these different files. So in one, I'm just splitting up a raw data file um, into eight pieces, into eight separate files. Um, in this one, getcalls.py, um, I am selecting just the make model in years columns from this data set. It's a, it's a data set of electric vehicles from California. Um, I will get to that. Um, it's, it's like a default variable that, that helps you like cut down on typing and, and it's, it looks cryptic. It looks kind of like Perl or something, uh, but uh, it, it does help you um, save on typing once you get, get used to the, to the look. And then this final um, recipe uh, is selecting just lines from the, um, from the file that refer to particular model years of cars. So, switch back here. So how to use them. Um, the golden rule for make is always do a dry run. Uh, you wanna find out what it's gonna do first, especially if it's a long running process or there's a lot of stuff involved. Um, the way I used it at my uh, previous job we made these big data pipelines. They were all on-prem, like data processing um, jobs that some would take hours, some would take days. Um, and so one of my coworkers would actually always make the default rule, something that didn't do anything, but just said, have you read the make file? Have you, <laughs> you know, actually looked at what's going on here? before you're trying to run make. And in order to run the actual project, you'd have to issue a different command. You'd have to say make you know, all files or something like that. Um, so just to discourage people from blindly running make and setting off a two day long project without realizing what they were doing. Um, so anyway, you can do make n, that's, that's the default target, just doing a dry run. Or you can do make n and then my target. Um, so, you know, for this project, make dash n, that same dependency graph that we were looking at before, is, that's a representation of these, the output of these commands. So, um, just that split, a bunch of calls to this Python script with these different split up versions of the text file, and, uh, you know, and so forth. So I wanted to give a little bit of a, like one of the reasons to choose make as um, a processing tool is that you can easily set things up in parallel, sort of run in parallel. You can do the same thing in, in, um, in say, uh, Bash or some other scripting language, but make does make it pretty easy. Um, I don't have to tell it which piece runs in parallel because I've specified all of the dependencies and all of the targets, make can figure out what runs, what can run with, you know, at the same time as other, other scripts. Um, so um, you can tell make to run with just one job slot or, you know, by, you know, without any option here, or you can give it, you know, as many job slots as you want. You can, you can say make dash J um, and don't give it a number and it'll use as many job slots as it can. As, as, but it's not gonna limit itself to what's on the machine, number of processors on the machine. So by default, I would, I would say at least limit yourself to that. Um, you don't wanna launch you know, a fork bomb essentially and, and be waiting for all of these, these scripts to run. So uh, I wanna give you a little bit of flavor of um, what this is, this is not going to take long. Um, 
So I just added artificially a couple of sleep, a sleep in this Python script to make it take a little bit longer so we can just demonstrate, okay, we've got eight different files being processed um, and right now they're being processed serially. So this whole, this whole make takes about nine seconds. Um, if I clean the project and um, do a time this with just make dash j8, which I happen to know is how many that it can use. You see, boom, all those Python scripts are done and the, the cats hardly take any time. So, so the entire thing takes 1.5 seconds instead of, uh, instead of nearly nine. Um, so obviously toy example, but when you're talking about lots of things running in parallel and you have you know, a 1632 whatever processor machine, you can definitely get a lot of throughput um, by using that. So some common errors. Um, at, issues and, and their solutions. Um, if make gives you this message, the no rule to make target, and I, I did that by simply doing make blah. No rule to make target, blah, stop. It just means that make doesn't know what that is. You haven't specified it in your file somewhere. So there's a chance, if you think it's a target you should have, you either made a misspelling or you know, it's in a different make file or something. Um, if your make file always wants to build a particular file, even when you know it's up to date, like you just ran the entire make and somehow make still thinks it needs to run that same file, then somehow its timestamp is not getting updated properly. In rare cases, if your program finishes really quickly and writes to that file, um, it, can, it can happen so that even though you have the dependencies established properly, make still thinks that your, your, fun, your program hasn't run, you know, and, and that file is still out of date. So the way to solve that is just with a little extra um, command to the recipe. Uh, so you just sleep for a second and then touch the file. And the dash C on the touch means don't create the file. So if you messed up somehow and you wanted to and um, <clears throat> you're not actually writing to the file or you're writing to a different file, um, the touch will not create the file. It'll only update a timestamp in this case. So it's a, it's a little safety measure. Instead of doing a regular touch command, which will create the file, and you just, you just have an empty file with nothing in it. Um, this is more of a workaround. So everything that make uh, deals with is file-based. If you have a recipe where you're actually updating a database or uh, you're hitting a REST API or something like that, you're not actually creating a file on the file system, then just create a log file or some kind of like se semaphore type file saying, hey, I've done this thing. Um, and you might want to consider using like whatever the command is um, that you're running to do, to do this update and T the output to, to the log file of your choice. But, but then you want to make that log file your target. That's what you're going to call the target in, in make. Um, so how do you not repeat yourself in make file code? Well, number one, you use variables. Um, all of the variables in my example make file here, they're called immediate variables. Uh, they have this colon equals. That means they get evaluated before anything else in the make file, and there's not like a double evaluation. So there's, um, there's a type of variable called a deferred variable. It's, um, it's kind of more advanced. I'm not really gonna go over it too much. Uh, I've gotten away without using them for years. Um, they probably have their uses, but I'm not, I'm not um, going to address that. So, um, so the other way to save typing is to use those default targets and prerequisites, those special symbols that stand in for, for different files in the recipe. Um, so dollar at is, is like the stand in for the recipe target. Dollar caret is all the prerequisites of a recipe 
and, and dollar less than is the first prerequisite of the recipe. So for this example, um, you, I had to type output text twice, once in the, in the dependency specification at the top and then once in the actual command. I can avoid, I mean, I could rewrite this with those glyphs you know, in a much more succinct way. So that really helps um, cut down on typing and uh, you know, just saves you some time. Plus, if you have very common recipes that you're using, um, you know, you can reuse those for all kinds of different files and you don't have to change the actual recipe because you're just using the, those glyphs. Um, another thing that you can do to save or on typing and is to use the dollar shell and then a, a bash command or some other shell command um, to capture the output of that shell command as a make variable. So for example, um, you know, you can list all the CSV files in the directory and capture that as, as a make variable called CSV files. Um, and then you can, the only problem <laughs> with, with doing that is if they don't exist, you get a little error message from make. It'll still, um, like if you do a make dash n, it'll still um, run. You'll just get a little, a little bit on standard output that says that um, that file doesn't exist. And it'll still run normally if you, you know, if you execute the regular make. Um, so the things I've talked about, they're like little niceties. They're, you can do all of these things in some other shell scripting language easily. The place where make files really saves you time is when you haven't looked at the code in a year and it's time to rerun it again and now there's a bug. So you have some, you know, eight page or eight screen long make file or, or project um, and you found a bug and you have to go in and figure out, okay, well, you, you've probably run it and it got like halfway through the script and you found the program that has the, the bug and you fix it, but now you have to figure out what it, can I safely rerun? I mean, the safest thing is to throw out everything that you've built and start from scratch. But if you're taking days or hours to run those first steps, um, you know, that's, that's lost time for you. If you can go in, I mean, if you have a make file, it knows what the prerequisites are. If you have your, your scripts and your um, prerequisites properly defined, like you make your fix to your program and it only runs what needs to be run. Any, anything that is still good um, from your initial run, like that's, that's not rebuilt. So, I mean, this, this thing has saved me like so much time. Um, so responding to bugs and changes becomes trivial, like rerunning parts of projects becomes trivial. Uh, this is one of those tools, like old school tools, that like, just uh, really captures your imagination when you, when you get into using it for a long period of time. Um, so yeah, hopefully I've convinced you um, that you can save some time with Make. Um, to recap, stay dry, save time, and use make. Also, the manual is online. Um, that's, uh, it, it's pretty comprehensive. Um, it's, you know, it's old Unix manual style. So, you know, there's, there's lots in there. A lot of it is focused on uh, compilation, on compiling C programs, because there's so many built-in rules in make to compile things, but it, it really is something that you can use for generic building of processes, building of, of files, that kind of thing. All right, any questions? Yeah, Francis. Uh, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I, guess one, I guess kind of three. So I'm not sure what your use cases are if you use it more as like a build tool or more as like other, you know, other use cases, automations. What was kind of your aha moment where you were like, yeah, I want to go like all in on me and use this as like my primary? 
Um, I mean, it was actually in use at my company as a, a build tool for our data projects before, you know, before I started on the data team. Um, you know, up till then, I, you know, I'd used Make to build Linux uh, projects from source, you know, a couple of times maybe. And uh, just seeing the, the power and utility of the way that it was used there, like, was amazing. Um, I mean, it, it, like I said, you could, it makes it so easy to parallelize stuff. If you have a, a big file that takes a long time to process and you've got, you know, a chance to split it up and parallelize it and, and cut down that processing time, it makes it easy to, like, slice and dice and do that kind of thing. Um, but, but like I said, when you go back to a project that you've forgotten everything about and you try to run that again, um, sure, it, you know, you could do the same thing with a, with a, um, a bash script. And if everything works fine, you're golden. It, there's no big deal. But um, as soon as you encounter an issue and then you have to try to tear, you know, piece apart what you can run, what you don't, what you're not able to, to save, <laughs> um, you know, this, this just like that relieves you of that burden. It's like make will figure out, you know, what steps in that dependency graph actually need to be run. So you don't have to try to keep that in your brain space. It's, it's already there. It also forces you to be a little more meticulous as you build the project because you, in order for Make to work properly, you actually do need to dig out all of those prerequisites and say, oh, okay, this depends on this. Um, you know, if you encounter a bug and you didn't properly uh, define a dependency, um, you could potentially, you know, not rebuild when you meant to rebuild, when you needed to. So as you get into it um, and use it more, you realize, oh, okay, these things that I took for granted, like maybe you didn't put scripts as a dependency, um, like this this get uh, this Python script. If you didn't list that as a dependency initially and you only listed the files, and then you update the script, well, Make doesn't know that that you updated the script because it, it doesn't have any knowledge of that. Um, if you list it as a dependency, then suddenly, oh, you've updated the code, so anything downstream from this needs to run. So, yeah, that, those, are, those are my ahas. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, like a Docker file where it keeps track of like, the different steps in the current state almost. So yeah. That's cool. Does it play well with Ansible? That was, like, that was my second question. Have you used it with Ansible at all? I have never used Ansible. So, um, I mean, most Linux machines have Make on them. Right. Uh, there are other flavors of Make. There's uh, CMake, and there's probably others that I don't know. But... Um, GNU make is the one I'm familiar w with, and I, yeah, I don't know if CMake has the same sort of um, generic building uh, capabilities. When the one or two times I tried looking at it, it was focused on compiling C programs. It wasn't. It wasn't, from what I could tell, generic build. No, this was a like big iron, uh, you know, oh, okay. production server okay. where we did a lot of data processing, um, and it had like attached network storage for handling all kinds of, of large files. But this was all on prem; it wasn't in the cloud. Um, I assume you could do the same thing in the cloud, but it's still very much expected to run on one machine. Um, it's not like Airflow or, or some of the other schedulers and, um, that are meant more for cloud or networked uh, orchestration. No, there was no control. Oh. Yeah, so so it was definitely possible. Um, yeah, 
Um, there are probably ways that you could isolate, um, but yeah, we, we were coordinated enough that it, that it was not like, oh, someone else is working on this project with you. I mean, our projects would tend to run weeks or months and you, you'd be primary and you'd have a backup and nobody else is trying to run that same project as you. Is there actually a short circuit in me where it's like if this lock file exists, then it exists in me? I don't know that for certain. I, I would be surprised if there wasn't because there are so many features of make. I found a new one just doing this talk that I wasn't aware of. So um, let me just show you. There is a special syntax. Normally when you specify um, a target, multiple targets, so this vehicle splits line here, um, oh sorry. There's multiple files listed here, vehicle year and then you know a year string .csv. There's multiple files listed there. And that's the target of the recipe. Normally when you do that, it's going to invoke that recipe for each of those files. It's not, oh, all of these get produced by one recipe. If you use this ampersand colon, that means exactly that. Don't, don't run this for each file um, trying to produce each target. All of these targets are going to be produced by this one command. But, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you could do something with a lock file or something to, to enable you to isolate so that someone else won't. I mean, you could easily do it within individual scripts. So you could maybe have a script that says, um, you know, so, someone starting this project, create a lock file, and then at the end of the make, um, you know, remove the lock file. And then any, all the scripts would need to then just verify, hey, is the lock file there? Do I own the lock file? And yeah, I, I, totally possible. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you.